Well, thank you everybody for being here today at the Climate Center's webinar, A Climate Safe Vision for California's Heavy Duty Vehicle Fleets. Uh, we're really happy that you could join us for this important topic uh, today. My name is Duran. Uh, I'll be your MC here today. And um, I'm very excited by the incredible lineup of speakers we have. I will go through those in just a moment. And hello, Hoosh, nice to see you. I'm glad you could be here. Um, I just want to uh, do a couple of, just a little bit of introduction and a little bit of framing, mention a couple other things that we're doing here at the Climate Center that you all might find interesting. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. So uh, let's let's start with uh, a quick introduction. Um, oh, that's not where I wanna start right here. Uh, to, here is where we are today, Envision and Climate Safe California Stories and Solutions webinar series. This is part of a series of webinars that we've been hosting here at the Climate Center together with our many sponsors and partners. Uh, today's topic is a climate safe vision for California's heavy duty fleets. Uh, so if that's what you're here for, you're in the right place. Um, I do want to mention our next webinar uh, on building electrification stories from the home front. I'm going to ask my colleague Rob to drop a link uh, to the registration page. If that's a subject that's of interest to you, please do go ahead and sign up. That's going to be a, a great uh, topic also, as well as the following webinars that we have on a world beyond fossil fuels, sequestering carbon on land and sea, and much, much more. I also want to take this opportunity with all of you here at our webinar today uh, to alert you to another exciting thing we're doing, an in-person, uh, as the kids say, IRL opportunity to gather uh, together at the California Climate Policy Summit that's going to be happening in Sacramento on April 11th, 2023. That's going to be a full day of plenary sessions, uh, uh, workshops, uh, breakout sessions, networking opportunities. If you miss getting together with people in the real world, then please do consider signing up uh, and registering for this event. Uh, Rob will also be dropping a link to the California Climate Policy Summit at some point here uh, for you all to learn more about that and uh, sign up if you're interested in sponsoring or exhibiting, please do contact us. We'd be happy to have you there with us all in Sacramento. Of course, none of this would be possible without our many sponsors. I wanna thank our sponsors, Sunrun, Calpine Energy Solutions, MCE, Enphase Energy, uh, Renewable America, RNA, Think Local, Act Local, uh, LA Department of Water and Power, Sonoma Clean Power and Peninsula Clean Energy. These are some of the many organizations that agree as we do, uh, that we need to rethink our energy, our transportation systems in order to build the grid for the future and the clean energy, climate safe California that we all know is possible if we all focus our attentions on it. I also want to thank the many nonprofits and other organizations that help us promote and uh, get the word out about our programs. Uh, here are some of them, Community Environmental Council, Civic Well, Climate Resolve, Grid Alternatives, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, and Actera. Thank you all for helping us spread the word. And here's what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, after uh, I conclude my comments, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Woody Hastings. Then we're gonna hear from Kimberly McCoy, Bill McGavern, Kevin Leong, Tanya, Tanya Pacheco-Werner, and then Kurt Johnson from the Climate Center. And then please do keep in mind, we will have a robust Q&A session. So as questions come up, please put them into the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen. You can also put them in the chat. Q&A is a little bit better, but either way, we'll capture those questions, keep track of them, and answer as many of them as we can at the end of our program, probably around 11.05. We will wrap up at 11.30 on the dot. And so with that, I want to thank you all for being here. Couldn't do it without all of you, our uh, valued attendees. At this point, I would like to stop screen sharing and turn it over to my colleague, Woody Hastings, who's going to give us a little bit of context uh, Woody, tell us, uh, why are we here today? How does this fit into a broader vision for a climate safe future here in California? Well, good morning all, and thank you, Duran. And one little thing I want to add to the presentation you just made, which, is, which was right after the Q&A at the very end of the webinar, uh, we will have a call to action. So there is there are things you can do, people can do to take action, and we will get to that uh, at the end of the webinar. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Woody Hastings, um, the Polluting Fuels Phase-Out Manager for the Climate Center. So our Climate Safe California campaign is a set of policies 
a set of policies that will allow California to remove more climate pollution from the atmosphere than we emit by 2030, while creating thousands of jobs and building a more equitable economy. We believe in a thriving, healthy community, vision a future where every California benefits from equitable access to climate solutions, from clean air to renewable energy, healthful food, and more. And more. Addressing heavy duty fleet emissions is a key part of the campaign. All of the Climate Center's work is guided by three core principles adhering to the latest climate science, prioritizing climate justice for frontline communities, and securing a just transition for workers, their families, and the communities they live in. Our policy platform is built on four pillars phasing out polluting fuels from vehicles electricity, homes, and more, scaling up natural carbon removal in soils and habitats, investing in resilient communities and clean energy systems, and for unlocking public and private funding for climate action. In this webinar, the focus is mostly on the first one, phasing out polluting fuels, and in this case, from heavy duty vehicles. For details on the other parts uh, of, of the campaign, visit the Climate Safe California page on our website. People living near transportation corridors, distribution hubs, and other areas where heavy duty vehicles are present have been impacted for a long time with hazardous air quality. Now, the broader consequences of those emissions, the climate crisis, are hitting harder and faster than scientists did even a few years ago. And California is ground zero for extreme climate impacts, once again, disproportionately impacting those most vulnerable and least able to cope and least responsible. On the demand side, California's transportation sector is the number one uh, source of, uh, uh, of the state's climate warming pollution, accounting for roughly 41% of the state's total emissions. Uh, we need um, uh, to have a transition to sustainable mobility, phasing out vehicles with polluting emissions, no new gas powered vehicle registrations by 2030, good investments, sustained investments in emission transit and in investments in affordable housing near jobs. So this is your opportunity to endorse Safe California campaign. Rob will drop the link to the endorsement page into the chat. It's endorsed by nearly 1800 businesses, elected officials, nonprofits and individuals. And we'd love to be able to add your name or organization. And one last thing before I hand it back over to, to, to Duran, uh, I'm pleased to introduce this year, uh, you know, where all the action is in Sacramento. We have a bill tracker to help keep folks keep track of uh, bills emerging on climate, energy, transportation, sequestration, and adaptation bills. And Rob, once again, if you could, uh, if you could enter that into the chat, that would be great. That's the URL there for the, for the bill tracker, but Rob will pop it into the chat. And handing it back over to you, Duran. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Woody, and we look forward to having you come back at the end to talk about the action that people can take. Uh, so stick around uh, for the end of the webinar. It is That is one of the most important things we can do is actually take action and get engaged. Uh, but to help uh, uh, talk about this, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker. Um, I'm not going to give the full bio. We'll drop that in the link, but I will tell you that our next speaker is Kimberly McCoy from the Central California Asthma Collaborative. Uh, Kimberly, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, my name is Kimberly McCoy, a climate and environmental policy advocate from Central California Asthma Collaborative. And this morning, I'm going to talk about the health impacts um, and how the ACF rule is helping to address those health impacts. So as you know, a lot of Black and Brown neighborhoods, low income and vulnerable communities live, work, play, and attend schools that are around or near rail yards, distribution centers, experience the heaviest truck traffic. The advanced clean fleet rule will address risk and health and pollution burdens affecting these communities as well as put California on a path to achieve zero emissions by 2035. In these communities, residents are exposed to toxins and emissions from these trucks that will impact them throughout their lives. When residents reside around these businesses, they deal with a lot of health impacts like asthma, respiratory problems, preterm birth, just to name a few. 
Back in 2015, Central Valley Health Policy Institute here in Fresno did a study, and the study revealed that if you reside in these neighborhoods that are saturated with industrial facilities and distribution centers, you are automatically losing 20 years off your lifespan and will develop health problems. As a resident, as a kid that was raised in a low-income community around these facilities, I dealt with a lot of asthma. Um, my child was born with asthma, and it's a cost burden to be able to move from these communities to where you can move into a neighborhood that has a lot of, that is better than a, um, the neighborhood that is saturated with industrial facilities. A lot of residents just can't pick up and move. So we deal with the health impacts because it's affordable living for us. So being able to provide affordable housing as well as address the toxins and emissions that are coming from these trucks will be a plus for and a benefit for these residents that live in these communities. But I also wonder as a former owner operator who serviced 48 states, how, how this rule will affect them. You know, a lot of owner operators travel long haul and operate in 48 states. So this is how we or they provide for their families. Restricting them to just California would decrease their income and put them out of business. So how I do believe that this is a great start to achieving zeros emissions and the public health impacts will be reduced and we will have a, a longer lifespan. I also think about the cost burdens and the loss of income for owner operators. Even though I know there are a lot of incentive packages and grants available, they will just be restricted to California and their income will decrease. So I just think that we need to keep that community in mind when we're talking about the advanced clean slate because I was once part of that community. Um, but then on the flip side, I do see the benefits of the ACF rule because I was born with asthma. I have a son with asthma and I have a lot of relatives who still live in low income communities who deal with a lot of respiratory problems, lung cancer, just to name a few. So when we talk about the advanced clean fleet rule, I think that we need to talk about all communities and make sure that we have something for everyone in the advanced fleet rule because, you know, it's going to put a lot of people out of business. You know, a lot of people will not be able to operate as owner operators and will have to go work for a company and this will decrease their income. So I do see the advantages of the advanced clean rule, but I also see it from an owner's operator standpoint as well. Um, I just think it's a really great thing. And I think that this will put California on the right path to finally start addressing um, clean emissions and zero emissions, but as well, it's going to affect the owner operators later on down the line. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kimberly, and, and thank you for your uh, super succinct and very impassioned comments. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we need to think about this all in context uh, as well and keep the people uh, front and center in, in all of our thinking about policy. At the end of the day, of course, policy is about people. So uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention and, and, and highlighting that re really here at the start of our webinar. Um, you mentioned the ACF, the Advanced Clean Fleet Rules. So let's talk about that, Bill. Uh, Bill McGavern from the Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, we've got a little bit of time. So uh, go ahead, Bill, give us a little bit of context and policy perspective here. What are we talking about? Yeah, thanks, Duran. And I want to thank the, the whole Climate Center team for putting on this event today and for the great work that you do every day. Uh, at Coalition for Clean Air, our mission is to protect public health, improve air quality, and prevent climate change. And uh, cleaning up heavy-duty vehicles is crucial to achieving those goals. So it's something that, that we spend a lot of time on. And I'm glad that we're spending this time here today because I think a lot of people, when they think about cleaning up emissions from transportation, are very focused on cars, and, and cars are important, but these heavy-duty engines actually are creating more air pollution uh, in California than our car fleets are, and are increasingly important also from a perspective of their greenhouse gas emissions. I believe that the way to address this problem is first by having a strong regulatory foundation and then uh, complementing those regulations with incentive funding. Fortunately, uh, we have in California the Air Resources Board, which has a really uh, strong 
mandate already, a lot of statutory authority that it has, uh, and it knows how to regulate engines and fuels. I think that's really what CARB has done best over the years. And in fact, it's become a, a national leader in its engine and fuel standards. And uh, for many years now, CARB has been trying to clean up heavy duty fleets through a variety of regulations to reduce toxic diesel emissions and to move us towards a zero emission future. And uh, many of the regulations, and I don't have time to go into all of them. I've actually worked on all of these. One that I'm particularly proud of because we sponsored the law that made it happen is the heavy duty inspection and maintenance rule, which is being implemented uh, for the first time this year. And I call it the truck smog check because it's the first time that our heavy duty diesel trucks will have the kind of routine inspection that cars, which are actually much less polluting, have had in California for many years. So it, it's about time and that will um, bring really enormous emission reductions. Uh, we also have regulations in California that apply to off-road engines that burn diesel, um, which include ships, uh, include locomotives, include harbor craft, and then moving towards on-road engines, we have a forward-thinking rule that requires our transit buses to gradually move to zero emission. And we have the advanced clean trucks rule. The advanced clean trucks rule requires the manufacturers who sell trucks in California to sell increasing percentages of zero emission trucks. So that's the context that, that brings me finally to answering your, your questions around about the advanced clean fleets rule, which uh, Kimberly got us started talking about. Advanced clean fleets is a complement to the advanced clean trucks rule because it provides the demand for those trucks that the manufacturers have to sell. So we have kind of the push, manufacturers have to make the trucks, and now the pull is for the fleets to have to actually purchase them. And uh, it's, it's fairly complicated. I won't get into all the details, but they're, they're different categories. So one is drayage trucks. Those are the trucks that carry goods to and from the ports. And this is a really important category because the ports and other freight hubs are actually the biggest sources of air pollution in California. And the communities that are downwind of those freight hubs these are overwhelmingly low-income communities of color. So it's a key environmental justice issue to relieve those folks from having to breathe in that toxic diesel exhaust that comes from moving goods by truck and, and ship and train and the equipment that unloads the goods. So in this case, we're addressing those trucks. Those will have to all be zero emission in California by 2035. So that, that's a strong requirement. Uh, the rule also would apply to public fleets, would also have to get to zero emission by 2035. Um, and then there are uh, provisions that apply to what are called high priority fleets. These are the fleets of 50 or more. And um, they would have gradually escalating percentages of their purchases would have to be zero emission trucks. Those trucks can be either uh, battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell electric. Both kinds of zero emission trucks are eligible. And um, this, this proposal, it's been in the works for years. It's already had a full board hearing last fall. And we'll be coming back to the board in April for what we certainly hope will be a final decision uh, and would be a, a really significant rule. Uh, the, the final staff proposal is out and we had a major victory in our, our large coalition that's been advocating on this. We've been calling for having the 2036 be the date by which every single new heavy duty truck sold in California would have to be zero emission. Previously, the board had been talking about 2040 uh, and the new proposal does move that up to 2036. So if that's adopted by the board, and I think it, I think it will be, uh, that's a huge success for us. The other big ask we've been making 
is to reduce the fleet threshold. As I mentioned, in, uh, in some of the categories like the big long haul trucks, they, um, the proposal is that only those of 50 or more would be regulated. And we're calling for that threshold to be dropped down to 10 to bring in a lot more trucks, uh, reduce the emissions. And our labor partners have also been really strong on this because it would help to address the misclassification problem where um, a lot of companies are using kind of sham independent contractors to get around uh, labor rules and, and in some cases environmental rules too. There's also a federal angle here because um, a lot of the trucks that operate in California are actually not sold in the state of California. A lot of our rules do apply to them. So like that truck smog check that I talked about will apply to them. But when we're talking about um, requirements for new trucks, those uh, only apply to those that are sold in California. So we need the, the US EPA to come in with strong standards. They, they've got a proposal now which would lower the pollution of new trucks sold nationally, but it's not as strong as California rules and, and does not ha have any zero emission requirements. So uh, the federal government as usual is, is behind California and we need to keep the pressure on there. Uh, I also wanna talk about another important rule coming to CARB in either April or May for a final decision, which would clean up locomotives. I think a lot of people think that if goods are moved by, by train, um, that that is cleaner than trucks. That's not necessarily true because the, the railroads are using some very dirty old locomotives uh, that are spewing toxic diesel exhaust. And that's a really significant source of, of air pollution in California. It, it's also a problem from a climate perspective. So, uh, and again, the US EPA should have been doing a lot more in this area, but has not been. So CARB is uh, stepping in with uh, a proposal which is pretty innovative. It would require the railroad companies to fund a trust account that they would have to pay money uh, for using dirtier engines and then use the money to buy the cleanest engines. It also would say that by 2030, they wouldn't be able to use locomotives that are more than 23 years old in California. That's a really old engine. Um, and by 2035, they'd have to be moving to zero emission engines. So it's, it's another part of the sector that we need to clean up. Uh, ships, also a very large source of pollution in California, those large ocean going vessels that are bringing goods into our big ports like at Long Beach and Los Angeles and, and Oakland, uh, San Diego. There's a, there's a lot of ports in, in California. And so we need to clean up the shipping and uh, CARB has a rule requiring the ships to plug in when they're docked, uh, but they're now going to be going to the board and seeking direction to have a rule addressing the emissions from the ships while they're in transit. So uh, that will be coming to the board in May, another one that we're, that we're focused on. And then finally, I mentioned that it's important to have incentive funding to complement these regulations. It's those incentive funds that allow for the turnover of the dirty old engines to the newer, cleaner, and preferably zero emission engines um, much quicker than would happen otherwise. Usually the regulations can't make that happen quickly enough on their own, and that's why incentive funding has been so important. And that's determined by the annual budget in California. We know that this is a tough budget year, so we really need to focus advocacy on getting a continued stream of revenue towards cleaning up heavy duty engines, towards funding those vouchers that bring down the cost of those zero emission trucks and buses and the cleanest uh, locomotive and ship and boat technology. Uh, we've been lucky the last couple of years to have budget surpluses. So there is a lot of money in the pipeline now and we need to keep that going. Uh, this has been uh, this move towards zero emission technology has been an economic boon to California. There are dozens of companies making the clean trucks and, and other engines in California. 
Uh, electric vehicles are actually the largest single export for the state of California. So it's not a trade-off between uh, you know, clean air and stable atmosphere and the economy. We can have both. We need to have both. Uh, and I will stop there and look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Bill. Really appreciate that. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the budget later, but uh, let, let's, let's sort of flesh out uh, the conversation here by bringing in an industry perspective. Uh, Kevin Leong from CalStart. Um, we'd like to hear, you know, give us an industry perspective. What does this mean for the people who actually make and build and do and drive things? Great. Thank you, Duran. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here and, and, and happy to be uh, a panelist for today. Um, so as Duran said, uh, my name is Kevin Leong and I am the deputy director of uh, our data validation and assessment team at CalStart. Uh, CalStart is a clean transportation nonprofit a consortium of more than 300 member organizations all working together to advance and accelerate clean transportation and mobility solutions, both nationally and internationally. Um, our headquarters are located in Pasadena, but we do have offices um, throughout the country and also one in Europe as well. So in talking about the industry perspective of medium and heavy duty fleet vehicles, I, I wanna start by answering the question of, of why this particular segment is so important. Um, and if you look at the statistics on this slide, it becomes clear that while commercial vehicles represent just a small share of on-road traffic globally, um, they do constitute a disproportionate amount of fuel consumption and particulate emissions. And um, as Kimberly has already eloquently conveyed, uh, there are plenty of studies that exist that show exposure to these emissions are a direct cause of adverse health conditions. Uh, but if we dive deeper, we do discover a more alarming fact that uh, it is the lowest income communities that bear far greater burdens of truck and bus pollution because many of these communities are located near large distribution warehouses or busy freight corridors. Um, so therefore, when it comes to improving air quality and addressing climate change, from the transportation sector, this is where zero emission technologies will have um, a significant impact. Of course, uh, transitioning commercial vehicles to zero emission is much easier said than done. Uh, despite the many benefits it will bring, these technologies are still more costly than conventional technologies. And there is skepticism regarding capabilities and, and model availability, and that remains very high. So given the costs and uncertainties, uh, transitioning all vehicle applications at once would not only be burdensome and, and expensive for fleets, but it would also be an ineffective approach um, in encouraging widespread adoption of clean technologies. So therefore, uh, CARB in conjunction with CalSTAR uh, have developed what is called the beachhead strategy. And this identifies first success applications like transit buses, which typically have a shorter fixed route service with back to base operations and to identify those zero emission technologies uh, where the, the um, is currently viable for that market space and then using these early markets as cornerstones um, and then improvements to the technology growing supply chain and more robust fueling infrastructure can then be expanded into harder to electrify markets um, and this is a strategy that has been incorporated into carbs long term heavy duty investment strategy. In addition to establishing beachheads, uh, more does need to be done to successfully achieve goals of not only ACF, but also national goals of 30% of zero emission vehicle sales by 2030, and then 100% by 2040, which uh, the US and 26 other countries have committed to by signing a global memorandum of, of, of understanding uh, through CalSTRX Drive to Zero program. And though I won't be able to go into detail here, um, this roadmap defines six discrete yet connected stages on what is needed to achieve uh, the ambitious goals of the global MOU. Um, but the point I want to make here is that it's, it's not just California, but the entire country that really needs to come together um, in order to meet these goals. And, and though certainly California is leading the way, uh, we do need to think about how do we take learnings um, from our state and then apply those to, to others as well. So we're seeing the real capability to, to manufacture and offer zero emission uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles across multiple applications. And we're seeing that capability steady, steadily growing. 
Um, as documented here by the zero emission technology inventory, uh, which we call Zeti for short, um, this is a dashboard uh, that you can interact with on the Drive to Zero website. Um, you can look at statistics showing uh, model availability and advertised range. Um, and so we can see from this that um, a number of commercially available zero emission models uh, will grow um, about 23% from 21, 2021 to 2023. Um, and we have about 200 models available today. Um, and of the current models available, we are seeing that they have the operational range to meet a majority of use cases uh, in many applications, especially regional hall and heavy duty urban applications. With that said, it is still challenging uh, to meet the most extreme long haul duty cycles with current technology. But energy density of batteries continues to improve and also the planning of clean freight corridors are being developed to help address some of these current limitations. And despite this expanding capability, actual deployment volumes of zero emission trucks and buses are still relatively low and, and not yet on track to meet global goals. So there is a pressing need to accelerate market demand. And a good sign of, of, of that is that industry production and, and fleet purchase commitments are um, growing significantly over the next several years. In California, um, we've seen a good amount of traction uh, with 2000 medium and heavy duty ZEVs deployed. And this has been made possible by robust funding and strong policies from the California Air Resources Board through programs like HFIP, which provides incentives to help offset the higher costs of commercial zero emission vehicles, uh, but also Energize, which is a, a newer incentive program uh, for medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure. But in addition to that, CARB and the CEC have invested millions of dollars in demonstration and pilot projects, uh, which are providing valuable real world learnings needed to accelerate adoption. And this is the area that my team focuses on. Um, not only do we help administer these projects, but we are collecting and analyzing data. We are trying to understand what is the business case of these technologies? Is it working out for the fleet? And how are they performing against uh, their conventional baseline vehicles? And so while up to this point, I've only I've primarily talked about vehicles, the reality is, is that going zero emission is, is much more than just building vehicles, but really the entire ecosystem needs to be transformed. Um, and that includes charging infrastructure, that includes uh, different methods of route planning, um, solutions to manage and optimize energy consumption. And then we also need to think about developing the workforce to maintain these vehicles. So I'm going to talk about um, two projects which are putting these elements to practice, uh, starting with this one on the slide here, um, the Frito-Lay freight facility in Modesto. Uh, so this is a demonstration that is currently ongoing, but has developed uh, or deployed, excuse me, several zero emission platforms, um, including your tractors, forklifts, um, class six box trucks, along with chargers, solar, battery storage, and a, even a renewable natural gas station. Um, and at a recent media event, Frito-Lay announced that because of the success of this project, uh, which proved that they can replace diesel engines and cut greenhouse gas emissions by a significant amount, while still maintaining a strong business case, um, they plan to replicate this program at other plants across the country, um, which is exactly what these demonstrations are intended for. And, and not to overshadow all of the great work that has been done uh, to this point, uh, Frito also just received the first class eight Tesla semis, which um, have just gone into operation. And so my team, which is performing the third party validation on this project is very excited to understand um, how they will perform in revenue service. Volvo Lights, uh, it's a different but similar project um, in the South Coast Air Basin. Um, this one is unique in that it deployed zero emission technologies at two different fleet sites, uh, but it also included a workforce development component that partnered with local community colleges to design a technician program specific to maintaining Volvo's heavy duty electric trucks. Um, to the left, you can see a picture of the dependable Highway Express freight facility. And you can get a good view of all of the solar that they installed on the roof and also the, the solar carports that they uh, provide uh, that help provide shade for employee parking, which um, is a really nice thing to have when you are in the Inland Empire. 
Um, installing solar and energy storage have proven to be very effective strategies in mitigating demand on the grid, uh, but also reducing charging costs. Um, electric forklifts and yard tractors, the off-road equipment, um, these were a big hit with warehouse employees um, and it, it brought improved safety and comfort, but also a very strong payback period, which showed cost parity with conventional equipment without the needs of incentives, um, which you know, is a very big deal. Um, other insights that were, we gained include um, long lead times for charging infrastructure. So the need to really get started on that as early as possible because getting electric vehicles without a charger is a legitimate concern for fleets. And I mean, we are exploring solutions to address this, um, which include looking at temporary charging solutions. So these are all areas that we gleaned valuable learnings from on these projects. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can actually download the Volvo Lights Lesson Learned Guidebook. Uh, cover is here on the right side of the slide. Um, you can go to the Volvo Lights website and download that. So looking now at transit, um, electric transit buses represent a notable example of success where there is now tremendous momentum and confidence for transforming urban transit buses. Data from Zeti indicates that transit buses are the most developed segment um, in the zero emissions market. And this is aligned with the beachhead model. Globally, there are over 262 zero emission transit models available with a median range of 180 miles. And interesting as well is that fuel cell electric buses have significantly increased in adoption since 2021. And while we haven't seen as many fuel cell deployments, um, I certainly think that the fuel cell technology has a very important role to play um, on the pathway to fully zero. And then similarly, the electrification of school buses is starting to become a groundswell with short predictable routes, with growing model availability and lots of state and federal funding available. Um, and not to mention the health benefits that it brings to school children. And while many electric school bus deployments are already underway, um, the barrier here is many schools lack the administrative capacity to, to take on the time and effort of electrifying their fleet. And so here the need for technical assistance and programs to guide schools and, and to show them how to navigate all of the planning and the assessments and, and managing contractors, um, this is where that this is greatly needed. So at CalStart, we do see the need for technical assistance uh, resources across the entire board. And, and we are actively working on, on building out a library of tools and data sets and, and, and resources and planning guides that the industry really needs to, to transition and to accelerate transition to zero emission. Um, one in particular that I do wanna call out here are the deployment spotlights. Uh, this is where we highlight real world use cases and performance metrics of vehicles uh, that are eligible for HFIT funding. We just recently released the first five spotlights, which includes uh, a line electric school bus, um, and more spotlights will be released in the near future. So check that out on the HFIP website um, if you're interested. And, and by the way, all of these QR codes will take you to um, the website where these, where these resources live. So to conclude, I just wanna quickly highlight that CalSTART is actively collecting data on medium and heavy duty ZEVs, not just in California, but across the nation to, to better understand and validate how these vehicles are performing in different regions, use cases, geographies, and climates. Um, this is not a comprehensive data set, but it does give us a much better snapshot on how zero emission technologies are meeting the needs of fleets on a national scale. And then finally, we created this really neat dashboard that shows a lot of interesting metrics and learnings around the current data that we've collected. So you can see that um, on the project landing page, or if you are more technical and want to actually dig into the data, um, you can access the data set as well through Livewire. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening and I will be happy to answer any questions during the, the Q&A. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great perspective and certainly generated a whole bunch of questions, which we'll get to in just a little while. Uh, I did want to mention to our <clears throat> attendees uh, that uh, we have a couple more speakers coming up. Tanya Pacheco Warner from the Air Resources Board uh, will be joining us at 11. She is caught up at a board meeting, uh, so she's actually doing the work, uh, and she'll be here to talk about that in just a little while. 
Uh, but uh, while we uh, uh, it, uh, wait for her to arrive, uh, we've got a really important speaker now. I'd like to turn to my colleague, Kurt Johnson. Kurt, what are we doing in this regard uh, at the legislature? What can you tell us about bill bills that are currently being introduced? Uh, give us a little insight into what might be changing from a uh, legislative perspective in the 2023 legislative session. Thank you, Daron, and thanks, everybody. And uh, I think my colleague, uh, Rob, will pull up some slides. Um, you know, this. I'm realizing I'm getting a little bit, uh, I hadn't thought about this before. Like when I was a kid, I always, until I was 10, I always lived, I would have asthma and I always grew up until I was 10, like three doors down from major freeways. I never connected the dots into my brain until 40 minutes ago. But anyway, um, thank you. Um, let me start by introducing a little bit uh, about our program, the Community Energy Resilience Program at the Climate Center. We're seeking to to build the grid for the future um, that is clean, affordable, reliable, equitable, and safe. Uh, and a couple sort of background context things about what we're currently doing uh, in California that needs to change. So right now, our default energy resilience strategy uh, is diesel. Um, you know, when we have PSPS events, um, which we've had uh, to devastating impact in recent years, um, the resilience strategy is to fire up diesel generators. So in the last few years, particularly in the wake of um, outages and fires, 2019 and 2020, um, as recorded by the Air District, there's been a dramatic increase uh, in the installation of backup diesel generators uh, across the, the state, um, huge increases. And that's just the data which is collected by the Air Districts, uh, never mind the massive proliferation of sort of home, backyard, uh, propane, and other generators, which are a huge uh, air quality problem. So that's incredibly dumb as a state strategy. Um, and we can do better, which we're going to talk about by using electric vehicles to provide that same service. Also, the thing to know about how we currently run our grid, um, you know, we have in some cases a uh, huge amount of renewable energy uh, in the middle of the day, but that drops off as the sun comes down. And so um, particularly when we get close to running short of power, we fire up um, fossil fuel peaker plants to sort of supply the grid as the, the, the solar is coming offline. And those are typically um, disproportionately located in frontline communities that would suffer the health impacts associated with the pollution. So there's huge problems here, and there's a much smarter way to, to solve this resilience problem using electric vehicles. Um, sort of riffing off what Kevin said, the, um, you know, there's, there's certain class of vehicles is responsible for a lot of the particulate pollution, which is an impact. As I'll get to in a minute, um, the, these classes of vehicles are also potentially a new Sort of clean energy grid reliability and resilience asset, which is what leads to our legislative conversations. Um, next slide, please. This is just a quick summary. This is a little bit more granular version of what you've already heard, just in terms of this, the relatively small number of vehicles on the road today that are clean. Um, this is going to dramatically ramp up uh, as, as some of these uh, rules go into effect. Uh, the next slide just talks about what that might look like in terms of, of grid capacity. So as we ramp up um, both personal light duty vehicles as electric uh, and medium heavy duty fleets, that will yield huge uh, deployment of batteries, um, which could become a clean resource uh, to, to utilize, to enhance the resilience and reliability of California's grid. Like I said, a smart way to run the future grid would be to take all that solar, um, which we have excess of at certain point, points of the day, uh, particularly in the spring and fall, then have that stored uh, in this massive fleet of electric vehicles. And then during the evening, that resource can be ex exported back to the grid as opposed to using uh, fossil fuel peaker plants, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, so just some, some rough math here, you know, based on some, some ballpark calculations here, maybe you got 27 gigawatts of power capacity just based on these medium heavy duty vehicles by 2030 and 8 million light duty vehicles. So Add, a, add 27 gigawatts and 80 gigawatts, you know, more than 100 gigawatts of potential capacity. Just to put that in perspective, next slide, please. Um, this is a graphic of showing what was happening in our state on September 6, 2022. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but on that day, we came perilously close to massive uh, forced outages. We had insufficient power on the system. Uh, the governor uh, instructed the agencies to send out a text alert, I got one uh, saying, hey, everybody shut off your air conditioners. Uh, we need to reduce load. Otherwise, we're going to have outages. So 
that little blip down there because of that signal went to everyone's text on their cell phones, we got about two gigawatts of uh, demand reduction statewide to avert global or sort of, you know, catastrophic outages across California. So think about this for a second. It seems crazy that to keep the lights on, everyone has to get a text alert and we furiously go out and shut off air conditioners. Wouldn't it be much smarter if we were systematically using all the electric vehicles that are already most of the time sitting parked unused as a grid reliability asset? So using this ballpark math, maybe 2% of the vehicles, if 2% of that 100 gigawatts that's going to be online by 2030 could be a, a grid asset, um, we wouldn't new, need to do the kind of crazy thing we did on September 6th when we almost had an outage. So there's a huge capacity here to build a more reliable grid in California using these vehicles. Uh, and that's what we're trying to sort of accelerate through the legislation that we're working on. Um, lots going on in this regard right in this moment. Next slide, please. Um, the CEC is currently soliciting comments um, as we speak uh, on their, their EV uh, charging infrastructure proposals. Um, there's $2.9 billion. This is from a slide deck issued by the CEC a couple of weeks ago. Um, we and others of our allies are filing comments today and also tomorrow. There's a couple of different related CEC proceedings, which basically says, hey, uh, insofar as we're using these vehicles for uh, transportation, electrification, and clean air, let's also uh, get more bang for the buck for the taxpayers funding these uh, vehicles and these chargers so that these vehicles could also become uh, grid reliability assets uh, as well. And so uh, it seems like a, a logical policy step so that the taxpayers can get more, more benefit from the expenditures you're making for these vehicles. Um, so this is all happening. I mean, there's billions of dollars in federal and state monies uh, going into chargers and as well as vehicles. Uh, as a matter of smart policy, we really need to start um, prioritizing using these as uh, as grid reliability assets as well. Kevin already talked about school buses. Obviously, the, the duty cycle for school buses makes sense. Uh, you know, particularly like in July and August, a lot of them may not even be in the road uh, delivering students. So there's a there's a logical use there. Think about public vehicles in California. The state of California owns about 300,000 vehicles that it owns and operates. Never mind um, all the local governments that own electric vehicles. Uh, government employees are not typically on the road between 5 and 9 p.m. So just imagine if we systematically had all of these publicly owned and funded vehicles plugged in every evening to sort of help support the grid. Uh, I have a charger. When I get home, I just, as a matter of course, just plug my car in and then forget about it. Um, it's not too far of a leap to imagine a world where everybody just does that, particularly all these public vehicles. And so they can be utilized uh, by the local load serving entity as a grid asset. So it seems like a logical policy step to accelerate in California, which leads to the legislation, next slide please, that we're working on along with Senator Skinner. Um, this is legislation that would seek to accelerate what we're talking about, um, basically directing the California Air Resources Board uh, and the CEC to accelerate the extent to which uh, the vehicles that we're already funding through lots of public dollars can also be used as reliability assets. Um, actually, CARB uh, already has issued guidance suggesting that school buses in particular, starting January 1 of 2024, need to have vehicle to grid functionality baked in specifically so they can also become um, assets both for local resilience, like for in a local situation to keep the lights onto a building or more broadly um, to the grid through vehicle to grid. So huge opportunity here to, to utilize California's large and rapidly growing EV fleet uh, to also build a, a much cleaner and more reliable grid for California. So that's, that's what the bill is all about. Um, and, uh, Happy to answer any questions about it when you get to that point of the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kurt. And uh, I'd like to invite our, our speakers to all turn their cameras on. Let's let's do a little bit of Q&A. We have some time here and we've had all kinds of great questions come in. Um, and I see folks turning on their cameras. Kimberly, I'd like to start with you. Uh, there, were, there were a number of questions uh, related to your comments. Um, Public health threats, like what do you consider, what do you see in your work, in your community as, as the biggest public health threat to disadvantaged communities uh, that could potentially be solved through some of the solutions we're talking about here today? 
Well, for one, it will be the asthma rate that are within the young children and, and our seniors in our community. Um, black and brown residents have the highest ER visits in regards to asthma rates here in the Central Valley. So that can be a one as well as preterm births because you have these pregnant mothers who are breathing in these toxins and these emissions that go on automatically to their kids. So I can see that being addressed as well. So those are some of the impacts, you know, and then our seniors, they develop a lot of respiratory problems, breathing problems. Um, cancer is one of them. Um, a lot of our seniors and adults living in these, res in these residential areas never had asthma before. And all of a sudden now they have breathing problems and they're on asthma pumps. So I can see that as being a potential public health risk when we have these um, facilities and these um, rail yards and things like that around these communities um, because we're constantly breathing in. And then, you know, there is a burden of cost on residents that live in these areas because a lot of, a lot of times we're not able to just pick up and move somewhere. So as someone who experienced all of this and seen the cost burden um, effect that it had on my mother because she had to make a decision because I was a very asthmatic child, um, always in the ER, always sick. She was a single mother of two that she had to quit her job and actually move to a different part of town to give me a chance because mm -hmm. my, my pediatrician told my mom that she needed to move out of out of Fresno, move out of the Central Valley because we have the worst air quality ever. So, and I'm dating myself, but that was like 45 years ago. I'm 49 now and I have an 11 year old <laughs> who's dealing with the same um, problem. So it was a cost burden on me as well to decide, do I still wanna live in this community or do I wanna move to give my son a chance? Because he's a very active 11 year old who likes to play soccer, who likes to be outside. And because of our air quality right now, he's dealing with his allergies and his asthma. So now I understand the effects that it had on my mom, because I'm a mom now dealing with the same problem that my mom dealt with. Thank, thank you so much, Kimberly. And I think it's really important <clears throat> important that we keep those, uh, those health impacts uh, front and center when we think about the costs and the benefits. I mean, one of the benefits, you can monetize those benefits, but there's also just the human aspect of, of reducing suffering and increasing quality of life. So thank you so much for bringing those uh, important perspectives to the front and center of this conversation. Uh, Bill, I'd like to turn a question to you. Uh, there's been a number of questions about the California state budget, uh, right? You mentioned all these surpluses. We had big surpluses last year. This year we have less surpluses. Um, uh, there's been some proposed cuts. Uh, what can you say about those proposed cuts? Uh, are they concerning to you? Uh, uh, what's happening in, in the world of ZEVs in particular that might sort of shift or slow down the progress that we're talking about here today? Yeah, you know, during the last couple of years, there were big surpluses, and it was really the first time that we saw a lot of general fund money, the state's biggest fund, going to climate and clean transportation purposes. So that's been great. And, and promises were made that this would continue for a multi-year period. And we're seeing already those promises being pulled back because the proposal for the, the next fiscal year's budget, the one that starts on July 1st, is to cut back significantly on that funding. And, and the cuts fall uh, disproportionately on heavy duty vehicles and on the equity projects, those which are intended to provide clean mobility for disadvantaged and low income communities. So it, it very much is a concern. Now, no question the state's in a difficult budget situation. There are going to be cuts, but it's interesting, and, and even the reporters have picked up on this, that the cuts are falling mostly in the climate and transportation area. And unfortunately, we're seeing the administration uh, obfuscate the issue because they're still taking credit for the funding that is promised in future years, even though that money's not set aside in any way. So if you'll hear, the governor's folks saying, well, we had a $10 billion ZEV budget, and now we've cut it back to $9 billion. Most of that money is just purely a promise that's on paper. And if the budget continues to be difficult in future years, we'll see that cut back just as the proposal for this coming year's budget 
has been cut back. So what it calls for on our part is, uh, you know, sustained advocacy to try to make sure that the, the promises are actually fulfilled and to point out that, you know, this is money when we're talking about heavy duty and equity projects. This is not money that's going to help wealthy people to buy a Tesla. Okay, this is to help people in low income communities of color to get around uh, and also to be able to breathe clean air without suffering the burdens of the kind of asthma that Kimberly just talked about. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, that, that's a great perspective. Uh, and I, I do notice that Tanya has joined us. Tanya, we'll turn to you in just a couple of moments, uh, give you a chance to settle in. Um, thank you so much for being here. I do want to give one question to Kevin uh, before we turn to you, Tanya, Kevin from CalStart. Uh, Kevin, can you talk more about that charging infrastructure? Uh, there's a number of questions in this regard. How and where will we charge all these heavy-duty vehicles? Do we have cl enough clean electricity to power these growing fleets? Uh, what, what, what can you say about that? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a hot topic, uh, obviously, for medium and heavy duty electrification, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of different um, solutions that we're looking at really with, with charging infrastructure. I mentioned, um, you know, clean freight corridors and putting chargers on, on busy routes where um, trucks or shippers or, or fleets don't necessarily need to have all of their charging infrastructure on site, but can utilize chargers along these corridors. Um, there's electrification as a service that we're exploring in terms of, you know, um, you know, you don't need to take all of the burden of, of, uh, the high capital costs of putting in chargers and maybe you're space constrained as well. Um, so, you know, there are different options that we can look at when it comes to charging infrastructure. Um, the grid certainly, you know, needs to be, um, cleaner and, 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 also, um, I think, as I mentioned, solar and battery energy storage, uh, especially in California, those are um, great solutions to not only reduce grid demand, uh, but also making sure that you're powering your vehicles with the cleanest energy possible. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's just, there's, there's, there's a lot in, and I will say that, um, you know, there are a lot of different kind of programs. So uh, Energize and Reda. Reda is a more research focused project looking at improving um, kind of technology around heavy duty fast chargers and improving efficiency as well. Um, they're all aiding to kind of help kind of solve the challenges and solve kind of the, the big questions that we need to, to um, address when it comes to charging infrastructure for medium and heavy duty fleets. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. And, and we're going to come back to some more questions about technology and about policy and about public health uh, after we hear from our last speaker, Tanya Pacheco-Werner. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Tanya is co-director of the Central Valley Health Policy Institute at Fresno State and also serves on the California Air Resources Board. Tanya, I understand you were at a board meeting, well, which is why you're just joining us now. So thank you for everything you do. And we're interesting, uh, interested to hear your perspective on uh, California state policies as relating to heavy, medium and heavy duty fleets. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, a, a meeting on this very topic. So thank you so much to everybody. Um, I think if it's okay, I'll share my screen and um, we can go from there. Um, so I, um, I really wanted to um, just have a, a, a kind of a brief conversation with folks um, on this and let me know if you can see my screen, okay? Um, yes. Thank you. And, and really um, focus on really how we get, you know, I, I'm sure this has been talked about, you know, by previous speakers already, but that, that road from regulations to implementation, I think providing sort of that, that macro view, I think it's important in this context. Um, one of the things that for me um, has been a, a really key um, aspect of, of like why we're all here, um, you know, sort of beginning with um, Kimberly's presentation 
uh, is really that community engagement um, being so crucial. Um, when I see um, where California is today, I really see it um, being here today, not just because of um, the vision of our governor and our legislature, but I see it be, um, here because of people like Kimberly um, who and um, Bill who have dedicated, you know, their 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 careers and their lives to educating uh, regulators like myself and um, governments to really um, attend to those needs um, for those pollution burden communities. So I just really want to make sure that you know. Um, you, you see the votes and you see the implementation challenges and all of that, but we're having the conversation because, you know, um, people power is important and it matters. Um, so um, as has been talked about before, um, you know, we, we um, have a number of things that we're, um, we're looking at, I really want to focus on um, advanced clean fleets and then the implementation deadlines of existing rules um, already in the books, um, as some people have, have referred to already. Um, really for, um, for us um, at the Air Resources Board, um, the staff have really focused on um, how we get to that 100% zero emission transportation by 2045 were feasible. Um, and so really um, taking this approach of um, not just the sales mandates, which are very important, but um, I do want to emphasize that a, 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 a huge piece of the puzzle here and equally as important is enhanced inspections and maintenance um, on the way, right? So, so we have this 2045, but on the way there, you know, we are also strengthening and putting a lot of investment into enhanced inspections and maintenance um, to ensure that we, um, that the communities are protected today as well. And um, and that as as we begin to grant you know exemptions or, or we begin to see delays, um, that there isn't a delay in us caring and and stepping up um, in those communities as well. Um, so I said you know there's a number of things that have happened um, in terms of the heavy duty vehicles, um, you know staff. Um, for those of you that have been involved in in the um, advanced clean fleets rulemaking process, you've probably seen this slide before. Um, but really, this is where we're at right now, um, looking at um, you know what we've already done with. Um, regulations um, since 2018. Some of those implementation deadlines are coming up. Again, like I said, a huge piece of the puzzle um, in 2021, the heavy duty inspection and maintenance um, rule, um, things that things are gearing up now for that and a big focus and something that I'm heavily um, advocating for is how we um, prioritize um, the the inspection in those over um, overburdened communities. Uh, the, we also um, so the, the advanced clean fleets is sort of the hot topic right now. Um, you know, uh, really that idea of how we transition those um, high priority fleets, and I'll go into into a little bit about what um, different components, uh, different classes of trucks um, are are included in this. But then in the future, really, um, we're looking at uh, 2028 and um, other opportunities as they present themselves um, beyond for even more strengthening and more capturing of more trucks um, to fall under that transition um, to cleaner uh, vehicles in California. So the advanced clean fleets uh, regulation has these four components. Um, <clears throat> it has the sales requirement, um, and it, but it also has in terms of um, what we are people are using um, the drayage trucks, the high priority fleets, um, those with um, a, a fleet of size fifty and over, and state and local government fleets. 
Um, so really capturing a whole a whole range of approaches to get as much bang for our buck before 2045. So, <clears throat> The implementation challenges, as as everyone has talked about already, right, um, Grid, you know, as I stepped into the Q&A, I really want to focus on um, some of the things that will be of particular interest um, for me, um, which are um, the infrastructure in rural areas, um, ensuring that um, that we have that um, and, and we're, we're being thoughtful and understanding the additional cost that's gonna um, be involved in getting that infrastructure there, but understanding that, you know, rural communities, you know, really uh, deserve this transition as well in their communities. Um, and then, Anya, you know, I, yes, I just wanna ahead. I just want to interject for a moment. Uh, it, we've been seeing the same slide, heavy duty engine and vehicle omnibus regulation. I just wanna make sure that's a slide you intend us to be viewing right now. No, no, let me okay. uh, no let me share. So okay, there's your, from regulation to implementation, ACF regulation components. That's the slide we're looking at now, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. That one, okay. So implementation uh, challenges. There we go, let's, let's try again. And we're seeing your whole screen and not just a slideshow. Yeah. So maybe Let's if you want try again. No problem. I just I I you Yeah, so not sure what happened there. No problem. I've been doing the same thing. Let's see. All right. Sorry well, about you. the delay. That's all right. We Let me see. see. Are do you see implementation challenges now? We do. We also see the next slide on the side, but that's, I don't think that's a huge oh, problem. I apologize. Well, I um, I do think that maybe um, I will just do this just in the interest of time, just to kind of make sure we get the, the gist of it. You know, one of the things that for me, I really feel like um, is important um, beyond the rural infrastructure is the supply chain and really um, understanding that there is, there's a supply chain um, challenge, not only in, um, not only for the, uh, you know, when, when we think about, you know, trucks and, and getting you know our goods here but it's also the the goods that we're going to need the parts that we're going to need for this transition as well um and and that's that's a challenge um to be thinking about um but i do feel like one of the things that where you know at the state level and again that community engagement is going to be needed um, because we are not you know really tackling these smaller fleets um, today in terms of regulations they already are eligible for a lot of incentive funding and we've prioritized some of that incentive funding for smaller fleets um, but really you know once we they begin to be regulated um, for me, one of the concerns and priorities will be to ensure that there is sustained funding down the line to really fully transition those smaller fleets um, that aren't part of the puzzle today. So for me, I see in this regulation um, uh, process that, that we're in, you know, continual community engagement is going to be needed, particularly as things are implemented, what's working, what's not, what are you seeing on the ground? Um, what's the real world um, change and qualitative change that people are seeing in their neighborhoods, right? Um, and, and what are the gaps that we still need to address? Um, um, and what are the opportunities for funding and for this transition in the most impacted neighborhoods? How do we begin? How do we continue to prioritize um, those impacted neighborhoods as well as we think about heavy duty? Um, I think that we also need to make sure that um, our rulemaking is really having that public health impact. And then also um, really making sure that they, we find new opportunities um, for mobile source um, emission reductions that look beyond the traditional models of transportation, right? I mean, I think that when we look at um, 
uh, the the heavy duty space. You know, we've we've talked about you know transitioning the existing um, buses, the existing um, public transportation that's there. But really, you know, for me, I feel like in California, you know, we 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 can stretch our imagination in terms of really using this opportunity to expand. Um, how we move around in California um, beyond the single vehicle use and even beyond, you know, the, the, the source of business or the farm to highway to poor um, model too. You know, what else could we, you know, implement that would um, alleviate some of the burden in, in communities? So um, that's, that's it for me, and I really um, look forward to to continuing um, the conversation and in my role as regulator, you know, be, um, being available to listen to people and um, you know being that that person that can uh, hear you and try to bring some of that back into regulation that continues to protect our public health. Thank you so much, Tanya, and thank you so much for joining us on a very busy day. Um, and I'm very happy <clears throat> to move back into Q and A uh, with all of our speakers. We've had uh, you know tons of great questions and lots of good comments. Thank you all for your conversations in the chat. Um, I do want to point out to everybody that the recording uh, and the slide decks will be shared uh, with everybody who both attended the webinar and those who registered for the webinar and were unable to attend. Um, but, uh, I'd like to, to, to bring another question back and really, I'm going to kind of throw this out. And if you want to answer it, raise your hand. And if nobody raised their hand, I'm going to call on somebody. So, uh, let's, let's see what we can do in, in California. There is a public perception that public transport needs to be dramatically improved, right? I mean, we're such a car oriented culture. Uh, and to simply shift, and this is very related to the subject of heavy and medium duty fleets, because a lot of these vehicles, and Kevin, you talked a little bit about transit fleets. Um, uh, isn't that really the low hanging fruit? Should, should we be focusing on public transit and bus fleets uh, rather than uh, working uh, on all these private fleets uh, where we got to force people to buy things where the public is already spending money on vehicles and buses? Is that the low-hanging fruit? Kevin, maybe I'll start with you. And if anybody else wants to answer, feel free to raise your hand uh, and, and chime in. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the, the issues right now is, um, yeah, low ridership um, for, for transit, right? Um, you see a lot of buses moving around that are only maybe a quarter to a half full. So, um, and, I, and I think, you know, that really is a, a push and pull of, developing better transit systems and, and making sure that you're optimizing routes and uh, making sure that you're developing schedules where they're arriving on time because a lot of people, uh, because of that just added inconvenience of needing to wait at a bus stop and not being sure if it's going to, you know, get you to your destination on time. That's, that's I think, one of the challenges with getting people to, um, you know, be more open and, uh, taking transit rather than just taking their personal vehicle. Um, so I, I think, you know, and it's not just transit, I think there's other micro mobility solutions that need to be built out as well. The bus isn't always going to take you right to your destination. So thinking about, you know, how do we kind of build an ecosystem where you have like scooters and bikes and other things that will get you that last mile to your destination as well. So thinking about it holistically in terms of how do you develop a, a good network where um, you can uh, leave your personal car at home and get to your destination, um, you know, in a in a good and timely manner. So, um, so those are other, you know, I think solutions that we need to look at as well in, in order to improve the experience for the for the the end user. Thank you so much for that, Kevin. I certainly agree with you, having spent time in other countries where uh, public transit is more seamlessly integrated. Clearly, it's not just a matter of transforming our current diesel buses to electric buses. We need to do more and build out the whole comprehensive transportation infrastructure to reduce emissions more broadly. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Bill, I, I got a question for you. Um, we've talked about policy. You're a policy guy. And then perhaps I'll turn to Tanya with this same question. 
Um, what are the policy gaps? Are there any that we haven't talked about today? And if there are ones that we have talked about today, please highlight them. But what are the biggest policy gaps in the medium heavy duty sector to help address our climate goals and reduce pollution? Uh, what should we really be looking at? Uh, is it just bi-directional charging? Is there more that we could be doing? Well, you know, a lot of the problem is in the inaction by the federal government. So, you know, and CARB has done a good job of explaining this, that the, the sectors of emissions that are growing the most and will grow the most uh, if nothing is done are the ones that are primarily the responsibility of the federal government, where unfortunately, the states don't have that much option to act. So uh, that's particular if, if we're looking at uh, aviation, international shipping, uh, and, and locomotives. So CARB is doing what it can in those areas and it's probably gonna get sued for, for doing what it's trying to do. And we need the federal government, particularly the US EPA to step up. And then another gap I would just point to at the state level is trying to get the older diesel trucks off the road. And you know, through some mix of incentives and, and regulations, um, making sure that we're not driving those 2010, 11, 12 diesels into the ground because those are the most polluting ones. And um, you know, as, as others have said, often are in the hands of the, the smaller fleets. And so we need to help those folks to make the transition to zero emission. Excellent. And please feel free as we go through these questions, if you'd like to contribute anything, please just, you can literally just put your hand up in the old school, like as if you're in class uh, and I will call on you. Not seeing that at this point, I'd like to turn to some questions to Kurt. Kurt. Oh, um, you know what? If, oh, if Tanya, you don't go mind, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Please. If you don't mind, I just wanted to jump in on that because I do think, you know, uh, second to what everything Bill said, but I do think one of the things that, um, I, we have been um, looking at um, here, right? A, a lot of people are talking about the infrastructure of our rulemaking, but I do think that engagement into um, how the the cost of energy will be, you know, trickled down um, is important. I think that there are some um, things being looked at at the um, at the state level, but you know, really keeping that under control is really going to be key to ensure that uh, you know, once again, we don't have those um, unintended consequences um, in the communities that we're trying to help. Thank you very much, Tanya, and I appreciate that. And please do continue to chime in. Um, uh, Kurt, I got a couple, we got a couple questions for you around uh, bi-directional charging, um, the duty cycle of school buses and other fleets. How does it line up with grid electricity demand needs? I know you addressed this briefly in your comments, but uh, sort of at the core of it is the following question. How can we rely on vehicles for bi-directional charging when those vehicles are used for essential services and need to be reliably deployed? What has your research and what has our research shown as to how heavy duty fleets, school buses and others uh, can provide grid assets without compromising their essential uses? Yeah, so um, that's, I think, an open question um, that's needing to be figured out. And Kevin, I'm looking at your box as well. So yeah, school buses have gotten some press. There's a, you know, a, a couple of pilot projects in Southern California. I think um, Nuvi was a, the manufacturer that had various electric school. I was at the CalStart event uh, yesterday. Again, uh, kudos to, to, to CalStart folks. And I, there was a bunch of school buses there. Um, I think all of them, with the exception of one, were already sort of bi-directionally enabled um, and ready to go and be used as grid assets. That started to happen, um, like I said, in, in Southern California. Just a couple numbers interesting in that space. I think there were six of those used um, in San Diego. Meanwhile, I think um, we've got something like 600 electric buses. School. One of you guys would know the exact number. There's more than that are that are currently in California, and particularly as we sort of envision a future where. We're trying to have all um, school buses in particular be electric. That's a, that's a big grid asset. Um, our friends at the World Resources Institute have a whole program around that, trying to get all school buses nationwide going electric was great. So that the, the, the duty cycle there um, does make sense because typically they're not necessarily going to be on the road uh, between 5 and 9 p.m. and certainly not going to be on the road at all in July. 
And it's not totally a, a, a slam dunk. I mean, you know, it depends on the battery capacity of the individual school bus, right? Depending on how big that battery is and how many miles it drives, it may come back and after it's done delivering, you know, kids at five o'clock and only have a 20% remaining charge on the bus. So, you know, there, there's things to be worked out, but 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 in the sort of the, the 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 taxonomy of what's sort of the lowest hanging fruit, certainly school buses are on the list. Um, like I said, you know, public vehicles, vehicles used by by governments, um, like I said, government employees are not typically driving, you know, after 430 or five. And so I think we can sort of evolve to an ethos of all these, um, you know, government vehicles becoming a standard like plug in uh, afterwards. Um, I think some of the, the largest, you know, drage trucks, I mean, this whole space is still so new. I think um, people are just barely wrapping their brains around having these vehicles be be electric, never mind sort of taking the next step to sort of anticipating the extent to which um, they might become grid assets. You know, if you think about, um, you know, a grocery operator, or somebody that's driving grocery around on, on, a, on a set route on a given day, um, there there might be a or different other fleet operators, there might be specific use cases that really rise to the top in terms of making sense for, for bi-directional usage as grid reliability. But we're just at the beginning uh, of all this. And I would I would turn to Bill and, and Kevin and others if they have other opinions on the same question. Well, just to speak uh, to the, Kevin. yeah, sorry, Doran. Yeah, I forgot to raise my hand, but just to speak to the, the duty cycle kind of element of it. Um, school buses have such interesting potential for B2G because, um, you know, they usually operate in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, and then in the middle of noon, they're usually sitting at the depot, right, waiting to go on their afternoon route. And that is the time when you want uh, vehicles to be ready to provide power to the grid when, when energy demand is the highest. Uh, so just based off of that, that kind of operational cycle of, of electric school buses, that would uh, be perfect time to have them sitting and providing power. Um, also too, um, even though districts aren't really, you know, as focused on what the business case of buying an electric school bus is, um, because they operate so very few miles every day, about 50 miles a day, roughly 10,000 miles a year, um, you're not going to see that payback really as, 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 as you see with transit buses, which are going a lot further distances. So having V2G also helps to offset, again, the um, additional capital costs of um, electric school buses, which um, you know, might make it a little bit easier for, for districts to purchase um, these vehicles, at least until they come down to cost parity with conventional school buses. Um, in the San Diego Clean Mobility and Schools Pilot Project, we do have V2G chargers installed by Nuvi. Um, the V2G functionality hasn't been activated yet, so they're just basically right now DC fast chargers. But in a few months, we hope to activate those, and then we'll be able to gather some hopefully really interesting real-world learnings on, on how that actually plays out uh, for, a, for a school district. So, so stay tuned on, on that. Thank, thank you, Kevin. And, and we've just got a couple minutes left before I turn to my colleague Woody for our most exciting take action segment. Um, but I, I just want to give a couple folks a chance to make any final comments. We've had tons of questions we won't be able to get to on battery disposal, hydrogen versus batteries, fuel cells. Uh, I'm sorry we can't answer all those questions, but but I just want to give you each a chance to maybe give some final concluding thoughts. Uh, Kimberly, people are asking about your experience as as, as an independent operator, as a trucker, uh, you know what what do that what do those folks need uh, to to kind of help make this transition? I don't know if you can make a comment on that in the brief concluding remarks, but I'll start with you, and then I'll just give all our other speakers a chance to make final comments. Kimberly, well, for starters, we need incentive programs to be able to get rid of the 2010 or 2012 heavy duty vehicle that we're operating to be able to get into a cleaner vehicle. Um, there has to be infrastructure, not just in California, but throughout all 48 states that these owner operators are able to travel to. Um, without the infrastructure in place, it'd be really hard for owner operators to be able to get out of that truck to get into a cleaner vehicle. So first of all, we have to think about the infrastructure. I'm so glad that California is leading the way, but we have to get other states on board to be able to put the infrastructure in place to where we're still able to make a living. Because without the infrastructure, 
we will have to go get another job through another company, and that would decrease our income and, and potentially put a burden on the family because there's a lot of fathers and mothers that are single families that do the truck driving to take care of their family. So without that, and you know, you're capping their income, and I think that's unfair to cap someone's income. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time, but I want to give just a quick 30 seconds to the rest of our speakers. Uh, Bill, you had raised your hand earlier, so I want to turn to you next. Yeah, just one additional point that while we're on the road to you know fully zero emission engines, which we need to get to, we also need to understand that we've got a lot of combustion engines on the road, and they're going to be on the road for a long time. So we want them to run as cleanly as possible. And so the heavy duty inspection and maintenance rule or truck smog check that Tanya and I both talked about, that will actually save more lives than anything else that CARB has done in the last 15 years. So that's crucial. And we also have low carbon renewable fuels that can reduce the global warming impact and replace diesel in our engines while we're in the transition to zero emission. Fantastic. Thank you so much for pointing out those important uh, policy proposals, Kevin. Uh, final concluding thoughts in 30 seconds, if you can. Yeah, I mean, you know, really, we 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 need to make sure that these vehicles work for the for the fleet for the end users, and and so really just continuing to build off of the learnings, making sure that those learnings, you know, are informing the industry in a real time feedback loop. That's that's really important, and we want to make sure that. Um, you know, we're, we're taking all of the great work that's happening in California and putting it into practice in, in other areas to help accelerate adoption of these vehicles. Thank you, Kevin. Very well and succinctly put. Tanya, your final th concluding thoughts before we turn to Woody for our take action. Um, just that, you know, I, I really appreciate um, everyone here today and really, you know, want to continue to emphasize that, you um, people and organizations really have led the way to where we are here. And I think that you all are all essential in moving us forward to the next big thing that California is going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I couldn't agree with you more. And speaking of big things, I'd like to give the floor to Woody Hastings, uh, our uh, phase out polluting fuels program manager. Uh, Woody, what do you got for us today? Well, thanks, Duran. And folks, this is the, your chance to weigh in on this issue. As uh, Bill McGavern mentioned earlier, uh, the state uh, did have $10 billion for zero emission vehicles, and now it's $9 billion. So a little over a billion dollars cut from the budget planning, and that's not okay. It's a bad precedent to set, as Bill pointed out. It could be a slippery slope to further uh, reductions in the coming budget years. We're gonna make it really easy for you to take this simple step of sending a message to your, to your uh, represent, state representative. Um, Rob, please drop that into the chat, and it is a message urging them to uh, retain that billion dollars, retain the commitment to zero emission vehicles, we cannot lose sight of the uh, you know, enormity of this problem. And the, even when it was 10 billion, that's still really not enough to uh, address the problem. We need a consistent, sustainable funding. So that's the action for today to urge your state reps, uh, to state leaders to keep our Z zero emission vehicle budget uh, uh, intact as it had been uh, promised in last year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Woody. And uh, there's the link. Uh, thank you, Geraldine, for dropping that link. Uh, while you all click on that link and take this important action, uh, I'm just going to take a moment to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Kimberly McCoy, Bill McGavern, Kevin Leong, Tanya Pacheco-Werner, as well as my colleagues, Kurt Johnson and Woody Hastings, for being part of this important conversation today. Uh, Tanya, as you mentioned, uh, this is a team sport. Uh, we need to work together. Uh, private sector, nonprofit, and government uh, in order to bring about a climate safe future. Uh, I appreciate everything that you and your organizations are doing every day. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being here with us and our many attendees. I want to thank the attendees for coming. Remind you, our next webinar uh, it will be on March 15th, and that will be uh, on the very important subject of. Um, of building electrification stories from the home front. Uh, I also wanna remind you all of our policy summit, California Climate Policy Summit on April 
11th in Sacramento. We hope to see you all in real life and in person there. Uh, again, thank you all for everything you do every day. I see our time is up. We actually ran one minute over, so I apologize for the overage, but thank you all for being here. We couldn't do it without you. And I want to uh, tell you once again, thanks. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and hopefully on April 11th in Sacramento. So thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Ron, are we going to debrief? Uh, we can debrief now. I believe there is actually, uh, Rob, do you want to stop the recording?